Uh, tonight's talk, I think, is going to be very interesting. Uh, Dr. Chad File is our mechanical engineering professor, uh, one of them here on campus. Uh, he graduated with his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, and he uh, studied aerospace engineering. And uh, because of that expertise, he's going to talk to us about the history of helicopters tonight. Uh, we had one special guest who came all the way from California to Google's labs uh, just to see this talk. So uh, Dr. Kennedy from Google is here tonight. We're honored that Google would, would find this interesting enough for one to come along. So anyway, it's without further ado, Dr. Thank you. I have to start off with a little uh, kind of a little story here. Uh, we were having a meeting today. Uh, this, this may be inappropriate, but that's okay. I, I, I don't mind. Uh, so if, if you mind, you can cover your ears, I guess. But, uh, we're having a meeting today, and uh, some of you, most of you, may not know this, but my wife is pregnant, and she's due uh, almost today, in fact. It's, she, she's like right at nine months pregnant. And I've been joking with uh, Dr. Wallace about, you know, what happens if my wife goes into labor today? We, we might need a plan B. It just so happened we were having a meeting today, and my phone was on the table, and it vibrated. So I picked it up, and I said, well, I said it's my wife. And I looked at Dr. Wallace, and I said, uh, back pains are getting worse. When do you come home? And the look on his face was, just, was priceless. I was totally lying, of course. I was totally lying. So uh, uh, I, I have to I have to try to say that you know if, if you would pray for my boss for dealing with me, so he may need that as well. All right, so yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about helicopters today. Uh, uh, this is me from the School of Science and Engineering, and. For those of you who know me, anytime I get a new gathering of people together, I usually start off with uh, some conversation from a, a particular person. Uh, here it says, I applied my heart to know wisdom, and I perceived that this was a chasing after the wind. Is that too much? Sorry. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases in knowledge, he also increases in sorrow. Some of you may know who, who said that from the one phrase, chasing up the winds. You might know who said that, by the way. This is a lecture, right? So, uh, so I, can, I can quiz you guys in the way, right? So, yeah, Solomon said that. Anybody, you guys know that, right? Solomon said that. And what book did he say this in? One of the books of the Bible. Let me just, you just say it. Anyway. Ecclesiastes. That's right. That's right. It's a very depressing book when you start reading it, right? And he does say this. He says that, you know, uh, for much wisdom, in much wisdom is much grief. So you may be wondering why I'm starting off saying, you know, I'm going to give a talk to try and teach you guys something about helicopters. That's kind of a luxury way of saying it. But, but there's a, a clause at the end of this book. There's a clause at the end of this book that you can extract from that. And it basically comes down to, yeah, everything is meaningless without God. Without God. So I think I'm very fortunate to be able to come to a place like this where Though we do immerse ourselves in a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge about a lot of neat things, but we always here incorporate God into, into what we do. And I, I really, really like that about this place. So, so, so if, you were, if you're, if you're uh, upset about being uh, given a sermon that you come to my lecture, that's, uh, that's uh, I mean, it's too bad. I don't know, it's too bad. <laughs> so you may be wondering why helicopters, or in particular, why me, why should I be given a talk? And uh, essentially, uh, there's really a lot of research underway. You, you, may, you may think that the helicopter is built, it's been around for 100 years now, so we know everything there is to know about it, and nothing could be farther from the truth. There's a, a stark contrast between the development of the airplane and the very long, progressive battle to develop the helicopter. Uh, the airplane, we, we know quite a lot about, in fact. Uh, a fixed wing flight, we know a lot about. Rotor wing flight, there's still a lot of questions that have these lingering dot, dot, dots behind them. Uh, we have an aging military fleet. You may not care about that, but uh, somehow we've got to replace that in some way. So we're looking at the, what type of new equipment we can use to, to replace this aging fleet. Uh, helicopters in general, they have horrible efficiency. Horrible efficiency. It's, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever looked into like a solar, I'm sorry, not solar, uh, I'm on my solar kit here. On wind energy, putting up like a windmill in your, in your yard or something, the power goes. Look at the payoff rate on one of those. It's like 30 years, 40 years to pay one of those off. It's, the 
because they're horribly inefficient. They really are horribly inefficient. And a windmill is this kind of a, an analogy to a helicopter, really, in, in, the, uh, in that power uh, efficiency realm. I, gen I genuinely think the history is a bit interesting, so that's kind of why I chose this topic. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was on helicopters. I had to study helicopters for the whole time I was in graduate school, so uh, I, I don't know that I know a whole bunch about the history, uh, but I, knew, I do know bits and pieces of it, uh, and I know uh, a bit about the technical stuff, so I thought I could kind of somehow marry those two in this talk a little bit. I won't get too much into the technical. Uh, we'll keep this as a, more of a history lesson than a, than a technical lesson, but uh, I do want to add a little bit of pieces in there to just kind of show you some of the challenges that are involved. <coughs> And I just have a general interest in aviation. That's why I went with uh, aerospace as my uh, as my doctoral dissertation, as my PhD in uh, And in particular, I've always been interested in helicopters. I just think it's really cool that they they do what they do. They they don't, you know. Uh, one of my students who's not here tonight, actually, I was hoping to point him out. Uh, he described it to me this way. I never thought of it this way. Uh, but the difference, the, uh, 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 you guys know sharks in the ocean, right? They have to swim forward. So he kind of drew the analogy that the airplanes are like the sharks of the sky. They have to be moving forward to fly with the helicopter, more like the hummingbird, right? It can just kind of hover, go backwards, and so forth. So I, just, I find that just kind of neat that they can do that. And I didn't make mention, I don't know if I should have mentioned it or not, but that, that's me in that picture over there. Uh, maybe I should have pointed that out. A little bit more svelte, maybe I don't know. That was me as a graduate student, uh, office mate of mine. We're next to a prototype. I'm going to show that picture, uh, not that picture, I'm sorry, but that helicopter towards the end of my presentation. This is a prototype model. I don't even think there's an engine in this thing. I haven't even fully developed this helicopter at this point. This was in uh, May of be 2011. I think it was May of 2011. That helicopter conference you know, presenting a paper there. <clears throat> Uh, so the sequence of events, uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about, about some of the historical aspects, uh, key players that were involved, uh, those who really helped to uh, uh, define uh, uh, the progress in helicopter, what major breakthroughs that they really had to overcome, uh, were there any hidden drama with a question mark? I'm bringing that up so probably there is something, maybe something hidden that you guys might not be aware of, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you're aware of it that's not hidden, and maybe it might be more hidden. Some major advancements. Uh, what, what really? What were some of the milestones that really led to helicopter being mass produced? Okay. Uh, then we'll look at just a few visions of what, or a few uh, moments of what today's helicopter looks like, and then take a glimpse into what we think the helicopter research might be heading into for tomorrow. As, as always, anytime somebody mentions something about helicopters, they always start off with these two. So I'll, I'll just mention these two as well. Uh, the one on your left is it's a child's toy. It's like a spinning top. You spin it, it just flies up in the air. Those have been around, uh, at least as far as we know from documentation, uh, several hundred years before Christ even, uh, in China they were found. Uh, uh, the one on the right there is uh, Da Vinci's helical air screw. I'm sure everybody's seen that picture, at least anyway. Um, that, that, that never came to fruition. He never built it. There's no records of him ever building that. We only have the sketches that he created from that. Uh, uh, but he did create that. He, it is rumored anyway, I, I don't know of any written proof of this, but it's rumored that he might have played with one of these tops as a child, uh, but I think more likely than not, uh, that idea probably came from uh, it was Archimedes' uh, water screw that he had uh, modeled up. So I think that's probably where this uh, idea came from. But he, may, he might have had it to like that when he was a kid. Uh, it's hard to know. This, uh, he de uh, developed that as like late 15th century, I believe it was, the Da Vinci over that model. All right, so, so a few names here just to kind of uh, drop off. Uh, the first one is uh, a Russian, uh, Mikhail Lomonosov. He, this is all the way back in the 1700s. He developed what, what you would almost call like a desktop prototype model. It was a small contraption with two posts coming out the top. It was spring-fed, so, or uh, spring-powered, I guess I should use. But the top where these rotors, where the uh, masts were coming out, there's a set of rotors up there with two feathered blades. And he'd kind of wind this up, and it was tethered on a little string, just a small box by he did. He'd wind it up and set it loose, and it would spin really fast, and it almost produced like a lift. They, they wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't levitate or nothing, of course, but it would produce a type of lift that would try to pull up on the box. And that was kind of the first uh, real prototype, so to speak, of what 
later would become the helicopter mob. Excuse me. This next two, uh, the Burgett brothers, or it's probably Burgay, I'm guessing, I'm not sure they're French, Louis and Jacques. Um, they, along with uh, Paul Cornu, about the same time, just after the turn of the century, 1900 now, we jumped up quite a bit here. They developed some uh, actual full-scale models that were uh, you know, about the order of this table size here. Um, Paul's in particular was not manpowered, it was something that had to be uh, uh, operated from a distance, so to speak. But his had these four large rotors that were almost like uh, boat paddles that he used for his rotors. Um, couldn't really get off the ground very well, but it would try to kind of bump a little bit every now and then. It would produce a small amount of lift uh, that, uh, while it operated. One of the major breakthroughs that really come through, though, was this Juan de la Sierra. He was a, a Spaniard, and he developed something that isn't the helicopter, but what he did develop led to a lot of information that can be used for helicopters. And I've got a little, and I don't know if you're already reading the little picture over here, that's a, a movie I'm going to show for you here. It, uh, let's see if I can get this full screen. This was in a commercial. Oh, where it is. Someone here said, I don't know. No, it's too loud or not loud enough. It's only like 30, 40 seconds long. He's flying in San Francisco. A new idea, just as bright and cheerful as San Francisco itself. The auto gyro. I don't know if you can read the gear on this uh, banner being put behind you. It is an auto gyro. Right here, 1932. That says. So it's very close to the depression, right? Almost. He comes in. He see. He's got great control over this thing, right? Look at that. And it looks like. I hope you don't crack. This thing's pretty. Looks pretty crack. But to be honest, though, this auto gyro, the way this works, ah, right, so that's good enough. So, but the way that works, this auto gyro here, he he kind of took like a plane, which the year the plane was developed, I believe, is uh, 1903. Is that right? I think it's 1903. So it's been about 30 years, or I'm sorry, 20 years before uh, he debuted. This happens in the 30s. But he developed, that wasn't Juan de la Sierra, by the way, who was flying that tip. I'll just throw that out there real quick. But uh, de la Sierra, he develops this auto gyro in the 20s, 20 years after the plane comes about. What he does is he essentially takes what we have as a plane developed at this point, and instead of uh, using, now this one here also contained a wing, but he also developed a couple that didn't really have those wings, but instead just had the rotor above it. And the spinning of the rotor acted as the wing. It provided all the lift spinning around in the circle, provided all the lift he needed so that he could take up and take flight. However, he still required up front the propeller, the airplane propeller, for his forward uh, propulsion. So it wasn't really a helicopter, it was an auto gyro, they call it, or gyro planes, and we'll call it whatever. But because he was able to produce lift with that overhead rotor, that is what held out tremendously for the development of what would become now the helicopter. So, so before I jump into the helicopters now, we, we can answer this question. So why is this so challenging? I mean, what, what really makes it that really difficult? Well, Wayne Johnson in his, uh, his textbook, uh, Helicopter Theory, he, he says there's really three obstacles that they had to overcome. And I want to expand a little bit on the third one here, but his first one was finding a, a light, uh, a reliable engine. So for, at this point in time, uh, they're just now coming out with uh, the internal combustion engine, but they're really using steam engines for a lot of things. And a steam engine is really bulky. Okay? Uh, they need something lighter weight that produces a lot of power. Uh, number two is aerodynamic and structural rotor system. They're still, so they've got these wings, but now they need to kind of shrink them down. Well, well they don't know that yet. But they need to do something different to them, I'll say, to make these helicopter rotors. And the third thing is control. And, and Johnson just leaves it as control. They need to find a way to control the helicopter. But I like to specify exactly what that means. And in particular, you have to have stable flight, right? Stability, which comes from both hover and forward flight. You have to be able to bring this thing up into the air, and then you also have to make it go forward, right? As well as counter torque. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what these really mean, all three of these, as I get to them in the, in the slides here. So, yeah, as I mentioned, the steam engine is very popular at this time. I think I'm losing my battery on the corner here. The steam engine is very popular at this time, 
uh, but it, it doesn't produce very much power for its size, that is. Uh, we've got a couple of, of individuals who have developed really efficient, on the lines of uh, engines goes anyway, really efficient steam engines. We have uh, Hensley and Manley who are producing about uh, uh, seven, well, this is a, a weight to power ratio, so to speak, but it's uh, on the order of seven and three, but they still have these boilers and condensers that really bolt weigh them down. These large. Thomas Edison, he created a, a series of experiments. He used one um, uh, that was kind of like a modified, almost like an internal combustion engine. Uh, I think it was an internal combustion engine. I, I think that his uh, fuel that he used was gun cotton, which is uh, some of the same components that used to make gun powder. It's not gun powder, but it's, it's pretty dangerous like gun powder, though. Uh, and I think in some of the records it's uh, written, uh, there was some sort of a, an a explosion. The engine kind of broke apart, and I think he injured one of his workers, in fact. But through a lot of his experimentation, he got a lot of useful data. And he said there has to be a weight to power ratio that's as low as 1 to 2 kilograms per horsepower. 1 to 2, he had to come up with. And the numbers may not be that specific to you guys. Some of you students may be very clear on what a kilogram is. But, uh, the point of the matter is, the steam engine is nowhere near as efficient as what we need the engine to be. Well, lo and behold, the internal combustion reciprocating engine. Look at these fine specimens up there, right? <laughs> so once this came about and we really started to, to uh, utilize, the steam engine, by the way, does anybody know? Is it an internal combustion engine? Does anybody know this? Steam engine? A steam engine is an external combustion engine, by the way. And because of that external part, we have all these extra components. That was the condensers, compressor, all those other components. Where on the internal combustion engine, you can take some of those and put them in-house and have them uh, utilize them in the same operations. So there's just a couple of images I found. That once we were able to come up with the steam engine here, we were able to greatly lower that 7 and 3 that I mentioned earlier down to a more reasonable number, down around 1 and 2 that needs to be. And then, so propeller versus rotor. So now we're going to start to get into uh, the aerodynamics of a rotor. What, what, what I mean by when I say aerodynamic yet structurally sound. Okay? So I want to first kind of give you a brief description of what the difference is between the two. In general, in general, a propeller has a fixed, what I'm calling a pitch. That's the twist of the blade as it comes away from the rotor hub, or the propeller hub, I should say. In general, in a helicopter, if you've ever seen them up close, you see it's just like a fixed device. So the blades come out there at some twist or some angle, if you will, and it's fixed, right? There's no, there's no way to mechanically move that. They always keep them as a fixed, fixed device. Propeller is used for thrust only, just for forward direction. It's the, the shark of the air, right? It's to, to send the plane forward so that it can, it, can, it can fly and survive. And oftentimes, the way how you, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. For an airplane, the way how you maneuver your speed is you, you increase the, the thrust by increasing the rotational speed of the, of the propeller, right? On a rotor, on the other hand, you have a variable pitch. Variable pitch. It's a mechanical device with a whole bunch of moving components on that rotor system where you can twist the blade uh, at will with some controls in the cabin there that you can twist that. So it's, it's not rigid in its, in its design. Uh, the rotor is also there to provide not only a thrust for forward motion, but also to provide lift. So it has to lift the helicopter, and then the rotor is what makes it go forward. Okay, there's no other, like the auto gyro has the front propeller. You, for a true helicopter, you don't have that. The, the main rotor provides both the lift and the thrust. And generally speaking, generally speaking, you can you can fly a helicopter without changing the rotational speed of the blades. Now, Oftentimes, if you want to go faster and faster, there's a little throttle, a little crank on the, on the side shift here that, yeah, you can spin that and make the blades go faster. But you don't have to. You keep them at a steady speed, raise the helicopter up, and then go forward without changing the rotational speed of the blades. Without changing the rotational speed. So it's kind of a generic difference between the two. Really. And then, as far as uh, the airflow design is, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but those blades that come out from the from a, a rotor on a helicopter, they're not solid. They're not like a, a fixed, hard, solid piece of wood or whatever the case may be. Oftentimes, you'll have these like honeycomb, and don't worry about most of the names, and this is for, a, I think, for a specific type of blade, but you'll have like this honeycomb piece towards the rear half. That makes it lightweight, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this honeycomb pattern. That's, a, that's one of the uh, 
God's designs to, to give us a very structurally sound uh, body, yet have it lightweight. There's a lot of air pockets in, in a honeycomb pattern. It's a very, very unique design uh, the honeycomb pattern is. <clears throat> then the front end is a much more solid uh, part of the rotor. Uh, I, and really, I think it's more for a, uh, you know, if you're flying in a lot of dirt and debris, rain, hail, something like that, you want to keep the front of that rotor in good condition. You don't want the front to, to blow apart, right? That's, that's what's really starting your airflow, airflow around the blade. And then also the skin of the blade itself is usually a pretty rigid material. Uh, rigid as in uh, uh, not, not a porous material, that is, anyway. All right, and, this, and i got to be honest, this is about the most simplest picture I could find for the rotor hub before the blade. That centerpiece there, this is just for one blade. We're about the other two are, are missing most of the components there. Um, but I want to point out a few things here. And this is something, I actually wanted to find a video of this. When I was in graduate school, we had to watch the video of uh, this test device where the, 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 where the rotor blade was. There was a, there was a, I'll pick that up a here. There was a camera on that rotor blade that would rotate around with it. So you can watch what happens to the blade as it goes around and around and around. And it's traveling pretty high clip, you know, spinning around pretty quick. The amount of movement that that blade goes through is just phenomenal, how much, how much warping and twisting. And if you were to cap that as a rigid connection like a propeller would be, there'd be so much stress and strain on that rotor blade, it wouldn't last. It wouldn't last long at all. And in fact, the early ones who tried to do that found that to be the case. They just don't last long. You need some way to allow that flexibility to just transfer through smoothly. And so what they did is they have what's called a flap hinge that allows the whole rotor, uh, I'm sorry, the whole blade to rock up and down. There's quite a bit of degree of flexibility in that. Same thing with a what's called a lead or lag hinge, allows the blade to actually flex this way. There's a hinge that allows the blade to go back and forth through the motion. This way. And there's also a pitch, and this, this has a little pitch change rod where you can actually physically change the pitch, uh, uh, which you do need to do that, and I'll describe that, as it's going around and around and around. Okay? So, <clears throat> I want to show this, I want to show this, and this is the one where I've got to be honest with you. If you are squeamish, then, then at about halfway through, you'll know to look away, okay? So, so bear with me on this. So this is some of the consequences that come about. This is a, a Bell helicopter. Uh, there's a guy that's going to talk a little bit while this is going on. He's a famous guy. I'll get to him later on, actually. And, and let's, let's make sure we make this full screen so you guys can really capture what's really taking place here, okay? So this is an early, early experiment. <laughs> Into the thing and jiggle it and roll it around until it started bucking. And the tail went into the road. And the big sister jumped into the thing and he was thrown through the wall. I took that guy's boot now, right? That guy was famous. He's on the ground. He's like, cut the hat. I rushed over and tried to get him thrown out about 30 feet. He gets up and walks off. But he was all right. Broke his wrist. That's all they had. Now, I got a question for you guys. In reality, when these rotor blades are spinning around, the have you guys, you guys heard helicopter, right? You know the engine sound. <laughs> when they come, where's that thump thump come from? What is that? How come the air airplanes don't thump 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 thump? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. That rotor tip, the tip of the blade, especially in forward flight, is at some, oftentimes at sonic conditions. You're getting a shock wave off of that blade that's advancing forward as the helicopter is going forward motion. Something traveling that fast at the speed of sound should have cut him clean in half, right? Why didn't he get cut in half? He only it just broke a wrist, all he got, broke a wrist. If you notice where he's caught at, how close he is to the hub, though it's traveling at that linear speed out at the end, those of you guys who had any kind of rotational uh, studies and in mathematics, you'll know that the closer you get to the middle, the slower the linear speed is. The slower the linear speed. He got caught very close to the hub. So it's more like a ball bat. Somebody hit him with a ball bat. Yeah, it broke his wrist. I mean, it's and probably damaged his pride for a while, but that's all the damage he really received, though. Right? So it, he's very fortunate that he didn't throw him out towards the edge of the road. Really. Very fortunate, really. But, so who's next? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah so he gets out and they're like, man, we gotta figure somebody else. Everybody's like, yeah, I got, I got, I got a break tomorrow. So, <laughs> so and that famous guy, I'll get to him in just a minute here, who he was. So, so they had problems controlling the helicopter. You think it's easy, right? You just, I mean, you want the helicopter to go left, you rock the stick to the left, or right, you just rock the stick to the right, right? Well, it's it's a lot more challenging than that. So I've got a little, I got a little flight, uh, a virtual flight demonstrator here. I'm going to show you guys a little something here. This is something that, that I had to, I think I wrote that. This was a, this was a big challenge for me to overcome, actually. But not, not spinning a plate on them. <laughs> um, but I'll see if I can do this. Let's see if I can do this together. So when I spin this around, I'm going to apply a force on here. So I get this straight here. If you notice where I'm pushing up, that's not quite where this is rocking up at. Wow. It's really hard to look. The front is what's picking up on that thing, but I'm pushing over here on the side. Okay? There's an interesting phenomenon that's taking place here. The front is what's rocking up actually. What's happening is you have a phase lag. A phase lag. They were not aware of this at the time. A phase lag. If you want, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So if you want the helicopter to say pitch up, for example, in forward flight, you actually you don't apply the pitch to produce more lift in the front to pick up. You produce it off beforehand, 90 degrees beforehand. It's where you produce the pitch, and that'll cause it to nose up. Same thing with roll right, roll left, and so forth. You produce the pitch. Uh, uh, yeah, you produce the pitch to generate that lift. 90 degrees before you, where you want the lift to occur. There's a phase lag, a 90 degree phase lag. They, were, they, they didn't expect this ahead of time. They should have, and they had a helicopter class like I had, but they didn't have it. <laughs> so it's interesting though, that's, that's a challenge. That was one of the problems why the helicopter wouldn't fly. They couldn't figure it out, they kept getting it up, and they'd do the controls where they think, well, I'm putting lift over here, I know, because I, we go in slow motion, but for some reason why it does something else, and then once it starts going, you know, your mind goes elsewhere. You're trying to make it do something and it won't do it, right? So that's, that's some of the reasons why they had such a problem getting this, getting this to go right. <clears throat> so another thing here. So that thump thump I mentioned, right, about the, the rotor blades are spinning around because it's coming at you. And it's, uh, it's actually, as it's going forward, one side of the helicopter blade, uh, of the rotor, I should say, is striking air that's coming at it, while on the other side, it's going away from the air that it's going into, right? So if you think about this, on one side, think of this, this green arrow here is kind of like it's going in this direction, right? The helicopter blades. You have this dissymmetry of lift because on one section of the blades here, you can almost have a negative lift, a negative lift. If you're traveling fast enough, the air is going backwards over the, over the rotor blades. You have a negative uh, production of lift there. So you have this dissymmetry of lift. So you have to be able to compensate for that as well. So forward flight was a challenge too when they got to that one. And the last thing is that anti-torque that I was describing, or uh, counter-torque that I was describing. You've seen helicopters all the time, right? They always have this main blade, and there's always a little bitty thing on the back, right? It's a little tail thing. Some people try to think that's something to do with forward motion. It has nothing to do with forward motion. Nothing to do with it. What happens is, if I were to have something, and I'm trying to spin it in my hand, you know, and hold on to it then at the same time, it's going to produce like a twist on me, right? But my feet are planted on the ground, so I'm not going to twist, I'm just going to resist the motion that I'm holding on to. But if I'm up in the air and that happens, I'm going to spin around in a circle. Right? There's nothing to stop me from that. And that's what's happening here. If there was no tail rotor down here, then as this gets off the ground, that fuselage is going to start to spin in the opposite direction. Spin uncontrollably until you kill the power source, right? <clears throat> so what they had to do is they had to find a way to counteract that torque, basically. So that's why they put the tail rotor back. One guy in particular was able to come up with this idea and capitalize on it tremendously. Talk about in just a second here. <clears throat> so that was a huge, another uh, challenge that they had to overcome that counter torque from that rotation. So, so then now, now helicopters are flying now a little bit anyway, we'll say. So now let's look at some of these models here the, the, of the very early inventions. Here's some, some German engineering, and you notice the little fancy emblems on these planes. It's back in the 30s, right? So this is some, some Nazi innovation here, if you look at this, right? 
And now, now this is the part that a lot of people don't realize. The Germans, they had a pretty good leg up on, on helicopter innovation here. Uh, this one on the left here, uh, that's uh, uh, Heinrich Fokke. In 1936, developed this model here, the Fokke Wolf 61. He only produced two of these models. He only produced two. They were two very successful, highly working models. And I think the, uh, the lady flying this, you can't tell from the picture, but that's a famous helicopter pilot because she is, I think, the first female helicopter pilot, actually. Uh, Hanna Reichen was her name from Germany, obviously. Can you tell us in the background of this picture on the left here? What does that look like? It looks like a stadium. It is. They're in the, whatever that, the Deutschland Stadium. Uh, I think it's in Berlin, or was in Berlin anyway. They flew this indoors. That's a closed dome stadium. They brought this in, kind of secretively, because anyone who doesn't know about this. They brought this in, and they showed this off to a large uh, Nazi convention that was taking place there. They brought this in, and uh, indoors. It's a, a pretty fascinating. Then over here on the left, or on the, uh, the right hand side, we have uh, Anton Flettner with the uh, FL 282. He did produce 24 of these. Uh, they were put into action, into uh, military action. Uh, he also produced a, a good working helicopter. Um, a couple of interesting things to, to make about this, though. They had some struggles producing these helicopters. Can you tell you guess why? In the 30s, they were just kind of struggling in general. But when they got over to this point here in the 40s, and they started really trying to produce these, there were bombs falling on their factories at this point. So once they started the work on the production line, Sometimes we didn't know, we just knew they were factories. We being the, the US or the British or whoever, uh, didn't know what they were producing, we were really producing something and we wanted to stop it, right? Well, it just so happened we were bombing some of their helicopter factories. Another thing to note on this is, remember the anti-torque I mentioned? You had to overcome the anti-torque? Where's the anti-torque device on these two? They're both helicopters. This one on the left, we could argue, because there is a front propeller on it, but it does come up, hover, turns, and there's a good video actually of this one on the left here. It shows indoors, she's bringing up, hovering, and so forth, and turning. So the anti-torque, it's kind of hidden almost in these two. There's no, no, there's two main blades, two main or two main rotors, I should say, on both of these. The one on the left here, there are two uh, tandem or side-by-side -side blades spinning in opposite directions. That cancels out your torque. And same thing with the one on the right, the Fletner, uh, the FL282. That, excuse me, they're also two side by side, but they're intermeshing. They're very close. The, 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 the props for these come up uh, very close to each other, and they're intermeshing blades. This proved to be a very successful model, actually, the one on the right. Uh, somebody else came along later on here in the U.S. and kind of capitalized on that, on that model. They used it, and we'll get into that a little bit later here. So using two rotors that counter, uh, counteract each other, or I should say, uh, counter-rotate against each other, counteracts torque. So you don't have to have that, that rear tail rotor, but you do still have to counteract the torque in some way. You do still have to counteract it in some way. So Fletner, he went on actually after the war, uh, uh, I believe, and developed uh, other types of uh, aerial devices and so forth after the war. Uh, but that was kind of his claim to fame there being uh, uh, the, well, that's a called a sink cropper, by the way, sometimes. Well, the intermeshing rotor blade on the right side. Sometimes today, if you Google that, you can look up uh, sink cropper and give you the intermeshing. So now, and don't mind the name, actually we're going to jump to the U.S. here. He's actually Russian, but he came to the U.S. Uh, as, a younger, as a younger man. Uh, Igor Sikorsky, he's kind of known as the father of modern helicopters. Even though he didn't really produce the first one, what he did produce is this one on the left, which you notice the main, the main rotor, and there, it's kind of hard to tell, but there is a single rear tail rotor. And he is credited for developing the rear tail rotor to counteract torque. And that's what, when you see a helicopter out, you know, uh, in today, 90% of the time it is this model. 90% of the time it's this, not this exact model, but this makeup with that the main rotor with the rear counter, uh, counter torque tail rotor. So he, he really uh, became successful. The VS300 is the first one, been third, 1939. It was after uh, uh, Heinrich Fokke, after him, but it was still a very successful machine. This one on the right here uh, came about in the 40s, and I'm going to show another picture of this later on in the slides here, a little better, better picture of it. I just wanted to kind of give you a close-up view. That's about the best picture I can get of him. So. All right, so I got a question for you guys. Uh, while we're on Igor Sikorsky, uh, is there any music majors in here? Anybody majoring in music? Anybody? Or you like music or anything? Anybody, anybody know who this is? Just a picture first off? 
think I have a, oh, I thought I had a little something down here. Right here. Who said that? Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, yeah, so I was going to play a little song with it. Yeah, that is, that is Rachmaninoff. Very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. Did anybody, anybody heard of Rachmaninoff, right? Heard of yeah, classic, classical music. Yeah, very good. Wow, that's <laughs> So yeah, so there's a story behind this guy. He, he, he didn't develop a helicopter. He didn't, uh, but Igor Sikorsky, before he developed the helicopter, this is back in, uh, Back in the 20s, I can't remember the year off the top of my head, 25-ish or something, 1925-ish or something like that it was. He was already in the aerospace industry because he had been working on airplanes before he worked on helicopters. He was trying to develop something to do a flight, an airplane, and so forth, developing his own type of model. Uh, here in the States, right? He's here in the States. He's from Russia. And he's down on his luck. He's having trouble even paying his few employees that he has left. They're, they're walking out on him because he, he just... Nobody's buying, you know, his design ideas that he's coming up with, and he's almost just about to run out of his luck. And the way it's written up, and, and you can go in the Sikorsky archives on the Sikorsky website, that's a famous helicopter company, and uh, you can still read the story, it's still there, that out of nowhere, the kids, remember this in fact, a black limousine pulling up, and some guy getting out in his long trench coat, some tall slender guy they described him as, didn't know who he was, what wasn't you know expected to show up? I think on like a Sunday afternoon or something. In fact, it's right on off. He comes up, doesn't say a word, just comes out, hears about Sikorsky doing this. So it's kind of like a Russian helping a fellow Russian, I suppose. He shows up, he looks the what this this little model they're trying to get going. Uh, uh, looks at looks it over, goes over, talks to Sikorsky a little bit, tells him, you know what? I, I think you got something going on. I think you can probably do something here. Cuts him a check for five thousand dollars in the 1920s. Five thousand dollars. That's like uh, probably like a quarter million dollars today or something, right? It's like probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. I, I don't know. Crunch the number real quick for that. That's, I mean, that's, a, that's a lot of money. Five grand back in the 20s. He just cuts him a check and says, pay me back when you can. Gets in the car and leaves. But from that, from that, Sikorsky's able to then fund his employees, go on to his new project, one he's been really dreaming of, and within about 10 years or so, develops the first helicopter with the rear tail wheel. And once he has Sikorsky aircraft, uh, kind of under his belt, he pays uh, Rachmaninoff back with interest. Pays him back with interest. An easy check one at that time, probably. So, it's a very interesting though how, uh, had it not been for Rachmaninoff's, the Sikorsky name would probably be unknown, at least the helicopter industry. Anyway. So, it's, it's a, a, very, a very interesting event that took place there. Uh, okay. We're having trouble with the corridor there, so maybe. Uh, so, this guy. Let me get my off of that up. So this guy over here, on the left-hand side, actually he was in that video. Uh, he was the older guy talking uh, when the, the shelter guy bounced up under the rotor. Uh, his name's Arthur Young, and his invention is this bar that comes across there. It's a stabilization bar. It helps the rotor blade. So oftentimes it had produced it with three or four blades, something, some way to keep a kind of symmetric uh, about its distribution of lift. With two blades, they were having a lot of challenges keeping that blade stable. They'd have to either spin it really, really fast or do something else involved with it. And he was able to come up with this idea of the stabilization bar. And actually, uh, uh, I think if you go on his website, uh, ArthurYoung.com, not the promoter or anything, I'm just saying, if you go to the website, there's a picture of him, uh, kind of in his younger years, he's got a model, uh, a little, like the very first rail controlled helicopter, if you will. It's a, it's a wired tether thing, but it's a model, a helicopter that he built and used the stabilization bar to help proved that it was stable. Took that to the Bell Helicopter Corporation, sold them on the idea, and now there he is designing the full-scale model right there. Uh, this model here, in fact, is the one they end up trying to make, or the guy flipped out of there, uh, but they end up getting it stabilized and, and it became a, becomes a huge success. He also used that in this model over here, what becomes the Huey 13, H13. This is kind of the, the hallmark, you know, the MASH TV show, right? Uh, that's the helicopter you always see in there in that in the TV show. That's the that's a Bell helicopter, Bell H. Uh, now, one thing to make note though is that that wasn't really the most popular helicopter in the Korean War. And I'm going to get to that here, uh, uh, just a slide from here. But uh, uh, but that's that's a very famous helicopter that we, that we see often. Right? That was his design. Uh, so another guy is Frank <laughs> Frank Paisecki. 
I gotta be honest, this is a goofy looking thing on the left here, isn't it? it you know what they called this? This is like a family, I mean, you look up the, this video, in fact, it's called it's called the flying banana. That's what this is called. And he developed this idea. It's the tandem rotor, right? There's two rotors. You guys heard of the Chinook, probably, right? I'll show people that later on, too. Uh, that kind of, uh, that idea anyway, came from uh, the development of this, of this flying banana, so to speak. Uh, Paisaki aircraft, uh, they went on to make all kinds of helicopters, just like Sikorsky aircraft did and so forth. Uh, but that was his, uh, his, his invention there, the, the flying banana, which was humorous. Back in the 40s as well. Right around, the, right around the end, uh, closing years of, the, of World War II, right? And here's a, a, another guy I'm going to show. And there's that same cropper again with the intermeshing blades. Uh, Char Charles Command, uh, he, he developed these helicopters here. Uh, again, in the mid to late 40s, he came up with the, uh, these helicopters. Um, actually, he just passed away here a couple years ago, like two, two three years ago, I think, Charles Command did. Uh, all the others have been dead for, for a number of years, I believe. Uh, kind of the last of those pioneers to go, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, he developed this uh, seat cropper, which, uh, in my opinion, uh, he, he, he might have stolen that from uh, Anton Fletcher's intermeshing model. I, I don't know, there's no proof of that. But, but it's, it's awful big coincidence seeing those two like that. So, <clears throat> so I, I had to put the statement in here, just a novelty question mark, because uh, Depending on where you read, at the at the trailing end, trailing years of the World War II, the helicopters are starting to be developed and starting to work really well, and they're trying to get the military sold on this. Like, look, we can we can find a way to help our soldiers or do something with the helicopters. Excuse me, but the military really thinks it's just a novelty. That's a, that's nothing that we can use. It, it's not it's not really gonna it's not really gonna help us do anything. They don't really they don't really buy into it, so to speak. They get a few models and do some testing stuff, but they just don't have much faith in it. Until the Korean War slash police operation breaks out, then this really puts the helicopter to the test. And this right here is the model that really does it, which this is the Sikorsky that Sikorsky was pictured in that I had some odd slides back. And this is not the Bell helicopter that you know you see with the traditional dome with the like the dragonfly tail looking thing, you know. Really this one here, and I don't know if you can oh my battery's out, but on the side of this helicopter here, there's like a little pod, a long pod. They brought these helicopters in to fly into the combat zones, pick up critically wounded soldiers, and bring them back to what they're referred to as a, I don't have written up there, to a mobile army surgical hospital, M-A-S, MASH, right? They fly back to the MASH units. And as it turns out, the, the death rate of the Korean War compared to that of World War II is dramatically reduced. Obviously there was less people fighting between uh, Korean War than there was World War II, but just, but also because of the ability to get in there, get a wounded soldier back to surgery immediately, semi-immediately at least, uh, proved to, to really save a tremendous number of lives. Tremendous number, who, at, in World War II, they, they would have just, they would die. They would have got an infection, who knows what, and wouldn't have made it back to, to a nurse's station to, to, to receive any sort of medical, condition, medical treatment. So uh, these were non-combat. They, they didn't strap with guns or nothing like that. They might have carried a pistol with them in case something would happen. There were no machine guns and missiles on, on these helicopters, just, just aerial transportation for, for medical evac evacuation units. <clears throat> and they were acclaimed as, as a hero, depending on what reference you look up, whatever book or whatever you read, uh, Angels in the Sky, Mechanical Angels, MASH Angels. So it was a huge success for the helicopter at that point. A huge success. And the military said, I need more of those. I need more of those. Unfortunately, they decide we need more of these because they can get in there where the soldiers are at, and they can also help fight, right? So then we've got Bell comes out with this Cobra, which is just strictly an attack helicopter, right? The Huey, which is light transportation, but also light uh, means of attacking. You got your Chinook, which is uh, uh, large uh, transportation of troops, anyway. And then you have this giant, the Sea Stallion. The Sea Stallion, the rotor blade diameter on that thing is like 70 feet. It's a ginormous helicopter. That's a real word, ginormous. And, and that is uh, for some serious transportation. You can put a vehicle, a small vehicle, inside the helicopter and, and transfer it somewhere. So, uh, and this is, yeah, during the Vietnam War slash police operation, uh, the helicopter becomes more, more of a fighting uh, unit than uh, just life-saving one. They also did uh, medical transportation as well in the Vietnam War, but it was, uh, um, uh, they tried to add in some fighting components to that as well. So then the question always comes about then is, so combat, that's just, 
the way of the future with a helicopter, right? But I don't really think so. If you look around, you'll notice in today's world, we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit to today now, the helicopter is used for a lot more than just war now, right? Obviously, you still have your medevac units, right? You guys probably see the helicopter more range than a lot of that. I think that is the, you guys call it Arch here? Back home, I'm winter St. Louis, where I'm originally from, and it's called it also Arch. You get Arch to ship you back to St. Louis. I don't know if that might be just the St. Louis thing. But anyway, that, it's a similar thing here. You get shipped, fly, uh, flown down to uh, Indy or you know, wherever you need to go, right? Uh, light transportation, uh, I put this in the, the light type narrow. Actually, a lot of executives prefer, if it's some sort of inner city travel where they don't want to get in a vehicle, they can kind of kind of skyscraper hop, if you will, from one building to another using a helicopter. Uh, firefighting is great for firefighting. You can, so an airplane, you see the airplanes come in, you know, swoop down over a fire, dump some large sort of fire, fire retardant material, and it just like cakes the whole side of the mountain, right? Or at least one little bit kind of strip of it anyway. The helicopter can come in there and really pinpoint where it's gonna dis disperse this, this load of, of water or whatever it is. Also has the advantage of where to pick up. If there's a local lake near that fire, it can come in, swoop down and scoop up that material and go up you know, from the water from the lake and then dump it on the fire that's taking place. So it kind of has a couple of advantages. Disadvantages are it can't carry as much payload as, a, as an airplane can. It can't travel as far as an airplane can or as fast as an airplane can. So if it's somewhere where you can get to it kind of close, then a helicopter does have a lot of advantages. Uh, tourism, people, you, you get in a helicopter and fly up the river or something all the time, right? Down the Ohio and Mississippi River, you do that all the time. Grand Canyon, so forth. News reporting uses it for traffic conditions and so forth, right? There's probably a couple that I'm thinking you might not be aware of, at least, right? So I've got one here. But I, uh, I don't know if they do this a lot around this area here. They do this back around for me anyway, so we'll listen. Can you tell what he's doing? Yeah, that's right. He's, he's feeding the bugs and the weeds, right? He's feeding them good plenty. That's what he's doing. He's like crop dusting, right? Now, there's an advantage to this over airplanes as well. The downwash from the rotor blades keeps that stuff, pesticide or herbicide or whatever, localized on that field. Whereas an airplane kind of swoops in quickly and disperses it, and sometimes if the wind's blowing, they'll drift over in the neighbor's yard and the, neighbor, the neighbors get mad because they're breathing and all that stuff, right? They, they, they don't want you know, whatever type of pesticides in their lungs or something, right? So th there's kind of an advantage. Also, the other advantage is you don't have to make the big passery go up way out there in the next field and turn around and come back and go way up. This helicopter can go down there, slow down, turn, and come right back, turn. More like a lawnmower does, right? You just you stay in your yard, right? You don't go out in the neighbor's yard. And, and, I mean, maybe you want to mow your neighbor's grass a little bit or something, but typically you just stay in your own yard. So this, then he can stay in his own field, so to speak. You just put, move back and forth, back and forth, right? All right, this one here was interesting. This is kind of lengthy, so I'm going to skip through a couple parts of it on here. <clears throat> but this is essentially labeled as, anyway, the world's largest company. The rotor blade. What he's going to pick up is a Boeing Chinook. That's a big plane, a big helicopter itself. Look at the people underneath this thing. The wheels alone are probably like four or five foot tall. Okay, the wheels alone. The rotor blade on this thing is, is I think, Remember, this is the Russian helicopter, MIL, the Mil, the Mi-26. I believe it's about 110 foot across. The diameter of the world. It is an enormous helicopter. Yeah. You gotta look this thing up. Carry it off to wherever. That's a very heavy helicopter, too. This Chinook is. Don't think about it. Am I out? Apparently there's an airplane broke down, not just any airplane, 
but a small jet, like a, I don't know if it was like, a, like an MD-80 or what, there's no description of what the airplane was, it was a very large passenger jet liner. And one of these uh, middle MI-26s came, comes in, looks up to, picks up that, you know, almost like a small jumbo jet, and carries it off. It's just a fascinating video to watch. The power of this helicopter is very, very fascinating. So, So with that, uh, I think I'm going to uh, kind of transition again, and we'll look at tomorrow now, what we think is going to happen for tomorrow. But, uh, uh, some of the research areas, at least, are pointing to where the research is located at. So it's a hybrid rotorcraft, and I'll, I'll describe just a little bit about what, that, what, what I'm calling hybrid rotorcraft, actually. Uh, morphing airfoils. That's an odd thing, right? Hopefully uh, I can show you what that is. UAV. Who in here knows what UAV is, right? Everybody here knows what a UAV is, right? What is that? Unmanned aerial vehicle, that's right. And MAV is, it is not manned aerial vehicle. Ah, I knew I'd start with somebody and say that. Manly. No, it's manly, by golly. No, micro air vehicle. Micro air vehicle. So we'll take a peek at, at these here. So the hybrid aircraft, this one on the left here, that's a, a brand new model that just came out at the Heli Expo out in Las Vegas, I think. Uh, I can't remember if it was 2014 or 2013 that this came out, but that's the exact model that I was standing next to that was once a prototype just a few years before in a few slides earlier in this presentation. It's the Sikorsky Raider is what it is. Uh, and what's interesting about this, um, hopefully I can get this to work maybe. All right, all right. So what's interesting about this though, and I'm calling this a hybrid rotorcraft because uh, at first off, if you look at the top here, you'll notice there's two rotor blades, right? Two separate rotor blades. That's not what makes it hybrid, though. That's just coaxial, so they're spinning in opposite directions to counteract the torque. So one cancels the torque of the other one, vice versa. However, what, what is harder to see is on the very back back here, there's a prop, there's a propeller for forward motion. So it's kind of like a, uh, sometimes it's called compound helicopter. It is a kind of combination between a helicopter and a plane, and that it has this, the, these two main rotor blades to lift, and then this rear rotor prop for forward propulsion, and at a certain speed when it's going forward, then these lose all transition of, of, of thrust in, in any sense and become just like uh, circular wings. They just provide lift only to keep the, keep the, the uh, uh, rotor flying forward. Then. And this one over here, this is kind of a neat one over here. This just came out, and I've tried to find video of this thing flying, and I cannot find it. Even on, like, this is the Augusta West on their Project Zero. It's all electric, referred to as a tilt rotor. These rotors here actually tilt. The only video I've found so far is they've been able to bring this up to a hover and kind of keep it in a hover mode for a little bit and then bring it back down. It's about the, uh, maybe about the size of these two tables here, maybe a hair smaller than these two tables-ish, about the width of the thing. So I don't even think they're in the like forward flight testing phases yet, or if they are, they're keeping it hidden anyway. So uh, this is very new technology right here, uh, but it's still really cool to watch. It's all electric, like I said, all electric. And morphing airfoils. I like this video. Uh, uh, again, I had Rock Mon off playing earlier, so if you guys guess, I, I, I kind of like classical music. I like it. And this video here, we have classical music playing. This is morphing airfoil. So an airfoil is kind of like a cutaway section of the rotor blades. It comes out and you cut a section and you look at that shape. It's almost like a, the almost like the Jesus fish, right? What we call the Jesus fish, right? It has a little weird shape to it. That's what we call an airfoil shape. Morphing means to distort the shape of that airfoil. And what we really like to do is eliminate. You guys remember how that dissymmetry of lift as the rotor blade goes in a, in a circle like that? We'd really like to eliminate that negative lift region over here. We'd like to eliminate that. So we need to use some sort of an active way to dynamically change the airfoil shape as it goes around these certain parts of the rotor path. And this little video here, uh, this is, uh, a, I think, a lab over in Singapore, I believe it was, come up with this. And yeah, it's morphing uh, wing. Uh, it, it's uh, Tchaikovsky uh, from, the from the Nutcracker. So. They're using uh, like a piezoelectric materials and some like a memory material as well. So they've got a way to change the shape of this of the airfoil. Now the, the, this is they just got a little motor to turn that, but it's not changing. 
shake it, shake it. But, so they take the shape of the terrafoil and they relax it and it goes back to its original shape. That's good song. Maybe that, that was really me I thought that. That's still in a very early uh, build. In fact, uh, one of my, uh, not my office mate, but the, a guy who had an office next to me in graduate school, his dissertation was based upon trying to find uh, a nice theoret theoretical model of uh, morphing airports. So that's, that's a very uh, a leading edge research right there. The unmanned aerial vehicles. Well, we've got to have Amazon and now Google's, Google X's uh, uh, project wing, right? And uh, Amazon, they're going to deliver all your packages right to your door in 30 minutes or less, right, they said. Uh, so it's some of the, I didn't put any videos up with these, but uh, you guys probably seen the videos, I'm sure, especially the, when the Amazon Prime came out, everybody had to, it was all over the news and everything. Uh, and then Google's, oh, cursor, sorry. Google's same way, it's got this uh, a similar type of device. It looks different, but they're both considered unmanned aerial vehicles, right? As it turns out, they both start in this hover transition. They raise up and they go off into some, you know, uh, transition somewhere, right? So it's kind of a, uh, a new research area that people are really getting excited about. And then the next one now, this micro air vehicle, this is the one you're really going to like because you're going to think they're going to take over the world when you see this one. Um, this, uh, this just started to come out when I was in graduate school. Uh, the helicopter uh, conferences that I would go to they would ask students to bring some sort of a model to demonstrate something with that model. And so now they've got competitions on these micro air vehicles, in fact. And here it is, I think it's University, yeah, University of Pennsylvania. They come up with, and this is kind of a lengthier video, it's almost two minutes, but I, I want to show the whole video here because, let's make this full screen here, because it's very fascinating how they come up with this. So, we developed a nano parameter capable of agile flight. Is, is this like a, yeah, see the size of it from his hand? Now there's nobody with remote control on this. Nobody has remote control. These are all programmed to, do, to respond to their surroundings, to do things. It orients itself properly and hovers. Here he tosses it out upside down and immediately orients itself and hovers. Here they put a program in to help to do a little flip. And do a multi-flip. And it's coming, maybe you've ever flown a helicopter. Very visual to fly. So now they put in programs where I want you to not only sense the surroundings that are static, the surroundings are dynamic. I want you to sense another, another one of these micro air vehicles around you. <laughs> now look, yeah, this, this gets good. This gets good. So yeah, so we go forward, backwards, they come in and go the same. And I just keep watching though. We developed a method to now, this is good. This is where it really gets good. 3D. So we gotta figure out where to go and how to get there. So in a minute here, they're going to show, they're going to put, you know, you got to get from here to here, but you got to have a window to go through. And how are you going to do that? They write a program that sends the surroundings and then say, you make the decision to execute. Who goes first, who goes second, and so forth. Nobody, again, nobody's got controllers on these. It's all done by a program. And this one just blows my mind. Down here the bottom left, you can see it's kind of uh, an overhead view of it. Making sure they don't crash into themselves, but follow this pattern, and make sure you don't crash into another helicopter. But that's just fascinating to me to be able to do that. That was this come out. There's a smiley face. See, little dot dot. That was really cool. I thought. And this this video will come out. Uh, good. It's just like last year, I think it was when this video came out. Uh, it was sent out through all of our aerospace and helicopter uh, newsletters, and that was just astounding to be able to do that to, to write the code and then to have actually have all the sensors to, to execute this. It was really, really impressive to do that. So, and so I'm making mention of research in both aerial and micro, uh, or I'm sorry, unmanned and, and micro vehicles. I'm asking why the wide research in that. Sometimes you need to get a helicopter into some place or maybe a person can't get into so a search and rescue type of operation. Well, I could bring a helicopter, a little mini helicopter right through into here and all through there, just give him the path that he needs to follow and say, don't run into something. And the helicopter just follows right on through and goes to where it needs to go. In a mission search, maybe it has a camera on it or something like that, or some other sensor to find something, right? So there's a, a lot of active research in those areas. So that concludes my talk. I got just under an hour, I think. He took two minutes to, to announce me, so I'm just under an hour. So I think I really makes it Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned efficiency at the beginning, but I didn't hear anything about it after that. 
That's a good point. Uh, I wish I could put a pinpoint a number on it. And, and in fact, uh, so there's a, a famous video, uh, well, it was a famous video, I guess now it's very outdated, but Sikorsky has this interview where he's uh, given a series of questions and he's asked about uh, when will the helicopter become as fast as an airplane? Does he know when a helicopter will become as fast as an airplane? Do you know when a helicopter will become as efficient? Do you know when a helicopter will become as whatever as an airplane? And he answers, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Everyone says, it will never be as fast as. It will never be as efficient as. It will never carry much payload as. It will never be able to go as high as. And uh, there's a lot of math that goes into why that is. But essentially, one of the reasons why is an airplane wing, you can get kind of a it's not technically correct to say this, but you should think of it as a uniform distribution of lift throughout the wing. Because the airflow is almost, there's a change in, in direction taking place, but almost a uniform airflow, the airspeed is almost the same everywhere on the, the wing. On a rotor, it's not the same. You get that large amount out there at the end, but as you navigate towards the middle, towards the rotor hub, the wind speed reduces to down to almost nothing, to where there's almost no lift. So you really get most of the bulk of your lift on the outer edges uh, as you navigate more further out on the, on the rotor blades. So that's what, and on top of that, the surface area of the rotor blade is far smaller than the surface area of, a, of an airplane. So both those combined, uh, you, you, you run the risk of losing a lot of efficiency. They're very inefficient machines.